ultrasound principles. This is really a talk about physics, but everyone hates physics. Actually, not everyone, but we're not talking about my kind of people here. Well, that's right. For people who don't do recreational math, the relevance of physics to ultrasound is that it helps you get the images you need. Tom, I think you've fallen prey to the law of too much animation. I love animation. Anyway, this is what we're going to talk about. Choosing your probe, what frequency to use, and knobology. We'll also look at Doppler and artefacts. Ultrasound machines work by building up a picture scan line by scan line. That makes one frame. They repeat this many times per second to create a moving image. For each scan line, the machine waits to listen for echoes returning. Whether the sound waves are reflected back or pass straight through a tissue interface is determined by the difference in acoustic impedance. So, if two media have the same impedance, there will be no reflected ultrasound at that interface, that is, no echo. When two media have very different impedances, almost all ultrasound will be reflected. Depth is determined by how long it takes for the echoes to return. For example, say there's an echogenic structure at 2 cm. The machine sends out a pulse, which is reflected, and the round trip time to the probe is 26 microseconds. Based on the speed of sound in tissue, the machine knows that the structure is 2 cm deep and shows that on the screen. So this is how images are created. To optimise an image, firstly, choose the correct probe and frequency. Ultrasound is just sound, so like the bass from a neighbour's house party, low frequencies penetrate well. That means low frequencies can image deeper structures. On the other hand, high frequencies give better resolution for superficial structures. We also need to optimise depth and width of field. Adjust the time gain compensation to get the same brightness from top to bottom and dial up the best overall gain. Finally, don't forget to make sure that focus is at the depth of interest if your machine has manual focus. Often your machine will have a range of probes or transducers to choose from, so which one should we use? Well, that depends on what kind of scan you're planning to do. For echo, you want to use a phased array probe. The small footprint with a sector-shaped beam allows scanning the heart from between the narrow rib spaces. For penetration, we typically use frequencies of 2 to 4 MHz in adults, or higher in children where less depth of penetration is required. A transesophageal echo probe is just a phased array probe mounted on a modified gastroscope, and often operates at higher frequencies because lower depths of penetration are required. Curvilinear probes are utilised primarily for abdominal and pelvic examinations in the critical care context. That's because they have excellent penetration, and the larger footprint, which affords a wider field of view, isn't a problem since there are no ribs in the way. You've probably used linear probes for vascular access. Probes used for this purpose typically have higher frequencies and so have good resolution at shallow depths, but handle depth poorly. Lower frequency linear probes are used to image deep vascular structures. As we said, Lower frequencies penetrate better than high frequencies. That's because high frequencies lose energy or are attenuated rapidly with depth. Exactly. So here we see the difference in attenuation with a 3 MHz probe that you might use for echo imaging a relatively deep structure versus a 10 MHz probe as you might use for a radial art line. We can compensate for this to a certain extent using the time gain control or TGC. On most machines, this is represented by sliders, although on some machines you may have a couple of dials or other controls instead. Either way, the TGC controls the gain or brightness of the image near and far from the probe independently. So we can turn up the gain in the far field to get a more even brightness to the image. Yes. Here the image is too bright or overgained near the probe and too dark or undergained at depth. We correct that by adjusting the TGC. Here on an echo loop, we see the effect of turning up the gain in the far field. Sometimes you need to increase the near field gain instead, as demonstrated here with a very bright pericardium and reflective lung tissue. Like a camera, ultrasound machines have a focal distance they show structures at this depth most sharply. 
while closer and nearer objects have poorer lateral resolution. Visually, that means that the ultrasound is smeared out laterally. We've all experienced a physical principle called the Doppler effect. Ignoring the volume, notice how the pitch of the motorbike engine drops as the bike goes past us. It's a higher pitch as the bike approaches and lower as it speeds away. Ultrasound machines can measure these frequency changes and use them to measure the speed of blood and tissue. Often they're represented with colour, here demonstrating tricuspid regurgitation. Blue represents blood moving away from the probe, and red represents blood moving towards the probe. This is called the BART convention. I can never remember BART. I just remember that when things get squashed together they get hot, so red. Whereas I think that's confusing. <laughs> anyway, there are a few controls that we can use to get the best results. Narrowing the width of the colour box improves the frame rate. We can also set these upper and lower limits called the Nyquist limits. For most purposes in echo, around 60 to 70 centimetres per second is appropriate. For low velocities, like through a big ASD or in a Doppler Venus ultrasound, we need much lower velocities. Ultrasounds can measure the velocities along the entire length of the cursor as seen with continuous wave Doppler or within a small gate as in pulse wave Doppler. As the name suggests, continuous wave continuously sends and receives ultrasound. Because it is continuous and doesn't wait, the machine can't figure out the depth of the moving objects, just the speeds. Continuous wave lets us see fast jets. You can set this scale as high as you like. Most machines will show that you're using continuous wave using this little diamond shape. But actually, you're measuring the velocities of all the blood cells anywhere along the cursor line, not just at the diamond. Pulse wave Doppler sends out a burst of ultrasound and waits for the echo, which allows it to figure out the speed at a fixed depth. This depth is shown on the screen as the range gate. The downside is that only much lower velocities can be accurately determined. If the velocities are off the scale, the signals get cut off and wrapped around to the bottom of the trace. You can see that this has happened in this trace by taking the bottom part of the trace and sticking it on the top. This wraparound effect is called aliasing and it happens in colour flow Doppler too. This patch of red among the blue is not because the jet changed direction, it's because the velocities exceeded the Nyquist limit set and wrapped around into the red zone. Because Doppler only measures velocities towards or away from the probe, we need a good lineup. For example, in this RV inflow view, the tricuspid regurgitation jet is almost going laterally, but the machine only measures the part of the flow in line with this arrow. So, the machine will give us a relatively low peak velocity. When we plug this into the modified Bernoulli equation to figure out the right ventricular systolic pressure, it will be a dramatic underestimate. Here we've looked from the apical forechamber and got a much better lineup within 20 degrees of the arrow. So we get a much higher peak velocity and a more accurate right ventricular systolic pressure estimate. Not everything we see on the screen represents reality. Some represent assumptions made by the machine. Four principles can explain most artefacts. The ultrasound slice has a thickness, principle one. It's thinnest at the focal point and thicker elsewhere. But the machine assumes that the beam is thin and uniform. This leads to beam width artefacts. Here in the left atrium, we see an artifactual echo density. This could be from the LA wall or some out-of-plane structure included in the beam width. Again, the machine assumes the beam looks like this. But due to interference patterns, it actually looks like this with extra bits on the side called side lobes. Now, if an object is in one of these side lobes, the machine will assume it's actually in the main beam. The resulting effect is similar to a beam width artifact. Happily, harmonics dramatically reduce side lobe artifacts. Principle 2. The distance to a reflector is calculated from the time it takes for the sound to return. But speed varies depending on the tissue, 
and the beam may undergo multiple reflection before returning. This can lead to reverberation artefacts. Here we have two objects at different depths. The sound takes longer to return from the deeper structure, so it's shown as deeper on the ultrasound image. However, some of the ultrasound can ricochet back and forth between two strong reflectors. It will then take even longer to get back to the machine, which assumes there must be another, deeper structure causing it. More reflections, more imaginary objects. This is a lung ultrasound showing the highly reflective pleura, about two centimetres from the skin. Ultrasound reverberating between the probe and the pleura produces these multiple extra lines called A-lines, shown here also at intervals of about two centimetres. This parasternal long axis image shows a pulmonary artery catheter in the right ventricle. Multiple reflections within or around this structure produce multiple artefacts behind it, called a ring-down artefact. Calcification, or prosthetic material, causes a similar effect, seen here in this parasternal long view, and here in this short axis view. Principle 3. The machine ascribes all returning sound to the direction in which it's looking. But the beam can be bent or reflected. This can result in artefacts, like the mirror image artefact, beautifully demonstrated here in this echo <coughs> loop. The LV and mitral valve have been reflected by the pleura, creating a mirror image artefact. So how is it that the anterior mitral valve leaflet and the LV wall are shown twice? When it hit the pericardium, the beam actually reflected. The machine thinks the ultrasound beam took a straight path, so it shows a copy of the anterior mitral valve leaflet here. Principle 4. The machine assumes ultrasound is uniformly attenuated. But this actually varies with the tissue. Here we see acoustic shadowing in the middle of the image. It's occurring behind a very echogenic mitral valve. The dark area is because nearly all the sound is reflected by the valve and very little penetrates behind it. Air tissue interface can have a similar effect and account for the common problem of poor windows with dropout as shown here at the apex. We can also get acoustic enhancement, not shown here, but classically behind a fluid-filled cyst. The ultrasound is transmitted through the fluid with minimal attenuation, resulting in enhancement deep to the cyst. So one way of categorising artefacts is those that create images more distant than the object, and those at the same distance. Thanks for listening to this brief introduction to ultrasound and the relevant physics. For more detail, we recommend the ebook by Gill called The Physics and Technology of Diagnostic Ultrasound. It's available at ultrasoundbook.net or on Amazon.